All right. All right, perfect. Just so I know the pronunciation, everything. Can you tell me how your first name, last name, what your role or title is? Yeah, uh, Jared, Dr. Jared L. Ross. And I'm a senior fellow at Do No Harm. Perfect. Can you tell me a little bit about a Do No Harm? What is it exactly and what is its mission? So we see all the harm and division that the pseudoscience and radical ideology that's being brought by these, these radical activists is causing in medicine and the damage that this is causing to children and to their desperate parents. Um, these activists are undermining real medicine. And so we started Do No Harm with the mission to combat this ideology, uh, to restore medicine uh, to the Hippocratic Oath in Latin, primum non nucerum, or first do no harm. And so we work on both protecting minors from radical gender ideology, um, as well as restoring merit to medicine and making sure that medical students and physicians, as well as the provision of healthcare services, um, is based on the individual and not based on class groups um, or sexual orientation or race, uh, really treating every person as an individual. Perfect. Yeah. And so can you just tell me a little bit, how do you think we got here to this point where now a lot of people view that um, child sex change for minors, for, for I, mean, I read in some cases for children as young as two, you know, um, even parents advocating, well, my child feel, feels like a girl. So we're going to go and we're going to do this. How do you think we got here to this point? Then we'll kind of take it from there. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think a lot of this goes back to the Dutch protocol, where Dutch researchers were looking at um, adults who were struggling with gender dysphoria, uh, predominantly uh, men in their 50s who identified as women and went through these medical and surgical um, procedures and were never really happy, were never really able to uh, live as women. And so the researchers posed a question and said, maybe the issue here is that these men have gone through a male puberty and have had um, a lot of masculinization, facial hair, and uh, a deepening of the voice and large muscle mass and bone mass. And maybe if we find these patients at a younger age and block their puberty and provide them cross-sex hormones, um, that they can live a happy and productive life um, in, in the gender they identify as. And so this was started as a research study uh, was done very carefully with extensive screening of participants, uh, with mental health professionals involved, uh, with very careful attention to detail to make sure that children who had uh, comorbid psychiatric illnesses like anxiety, depression, autism, uh, were not being included in this study. And despite and, and, and what we saw was that this Dutch study, then that protocol became adopted throughout Western Europe, Canada, and then the US. And during that progression, we saw these calls from activists saying that all of this screening is, is gatekeeping and that you're preventing people from accessing these services. And so what happened is we had this child industry develop, this industry where we're performing gender procedures on children, but without all the guardrails that the Dutch had put in place. And then the Dutch realized several years down the road, wait, this isn't helping. These, you know, even though we're, we're transitioning these, these children at a younger age, uh, they're not growing up to be um, healthy, well-adjusted adults. They're continuing to struggle 
from mental health, emotional, and and then the the physical challenges that come with all of these um, medications, hormones, surgeries. Um, and so the Dutch said, nope, this is this is a mistake. We're gonna we're gonna stop this. And that's what you saw as well with the the CAST review in the UK that the Tavistock clinic, the largest gender clinic in the UK, was was stopped. Uh, Finland has has ceased gender procedures on minors. So has Sweden. Uh, France is is probably soon to follow here. But what happened is this research never kind of came across the pond. It it did, but we had an ideology that pushed back on it. And so unfortunately, in in most of Canada and the US, uh, we're still seeing these experimental treatments being pushed on on children. And these are children that have, you know, real underlying comorbidities. They're anxious, they're depressed. Um, you know, these are, are peripubertal children, pu- children who are just at the start of puberty. And that's a challenging time for, for all of us, um, especially children who are growing up in today's day and age with constant exposure to uh, social media, uh, seeing what, you know, influencers and models are, are doing, constantly being exposed to the best things of people's lives and being sheltered from, you know, no one gets on social media and says, you know, I just lost my grandmother um, and, and does a, a video about it. Um, we have this skew towards, towards the positive, towards these tropical vacations, towards wealth and, and um, consumerism and possessions and cars. And, 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 and so you get into this mentality where you see everyone else apparently has a life that's much better than yours and the the lockdowns and and lack of socialization in school from from the covid pandemic i mean our data clearly shows uh this massive peak uh, in both hormones and surgeries in all 50 states as we come out of the pandemic um and so we have a degradation of mental health and we have activist providers and physicians who are selling this silver bullet who say, you know, just change your name, change your pronouns, change your clothing, take these harmless puberty blockers to buy time. And and we know that that's that that's not the case. First of all, we know that puberty blockers are not harmless, that they, de- you know, lead to infertility. Um, and then that, n- depending on the study you look at, 97 to 100% of kids who go on these puberty blockers end up going on to take cross-sex hormones. And that's where we see our blood clots and our heart attacks, our strokes, uh, our diabetes, multiple forms of cancer. We know that cross-sex hormones increases aggressive behavior, depression, suicide attempts. And so what this becomes is this on-ramp to these mutilative surgeries that that starts out as as fairly harmless, um, at at least in in, in idea, um, but then becomes these these very and and I don't want to get too graphic for your audience here, um, but these very mutilative surgeries that are really experimental and just fraught with awful, awful complications requiring repeat surgeries um, and and lifelong health care. And, and there's a huge financial motive there as well, that these, these kids then become lifelong patients and need lifelong medical and surgical care. And I think we're starting to see a a change in the tide here. I was just reading an op-ed from the New York Times that came out this morning um, talking about how this issue of of sex change procedure, sex change surgeries on minors um, is really, um, there's really bipartisan motivation against this and that that's really 
really growing that there's there's a huge negative sentiment against that um that that's really grown quite significantly so i was uh, i'm very happy to see that getting some coverage from the new york times on this issue yeah no absolutely i think just kind of going off the base off that last point that was going to kind of be my next question which um Kind of like, especially concerned the results of the last uh, last presidential election and sort of all that, where you sort of have the one side, you know, kind of advocating for for you know transgender rights and transgender movements among the young people, and so I was I myself was a little shocked and surprised to see the tide sort of shifting that early that quickly. Then what was kind of a landslide election, knowing you know one party was you know making stands and making you know. Um, known to have ideologies against this. And so that to me was like, okay, is the general population, are they starting to sort of like, you know, for lack of better terms, wake up and be like, you know, we don't want, you know, our kids being mutilated, you know? So can you kind of speak on that, you know, a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a great point. You know, do no harm is, is a, a science-based uh, factor of an organization where we're not political. In fact, we're, we're really trying to depoliticize medicine. Um, but this isn't a political issue. You know, um, adults can can do what they don't want with their own body. Uh, the issue here is is protecting um, these innocent children and their vulnerable parents. And these children are, are going through real issues, whatever, whatever the the root cause of that may be. Um, and this is sold as this this silver bullet. For, for them and and their parents latch on to this um and and it's it's really unfortunate because we know that the best treatment for most mental health conditions whether it be anxiety or depression or autism is is supportive talk therapy is very good talk therapy and instead we've had our medical system and to a larger extent our mental health system co-opted by these radical ideologues who force professionals, who force medical professionals, whether that be psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, into this affirming model to say, no, if, if you know, a child comes in and says, you know, I'm in the wrong body, they have to affirm this. And we don't, we don't see that anywhere else in medicine. We don't see anywhere else in medicine where the patient demands the care. We have patient-centered care. So we we talk to patients, we understand their their goals um, and and work with them in terms of treatment. But we don't have any situations in medicine where a patient comes in and says, I want X. It's it's not a buffet. Um, we go through, you know, four years of college, four years of medical education, three to seven years of residency, plus fellowship, plus internships for some of us um, to, to have this training and to to be able to help the patient figure out um, what's best for them. And instead, what we've said is in this specific area of medicine that we've carved out, that we are not going to allow any professional judgment. We're not going to allow any mental health evaluations. If the patient wants it, the patient gets it. And, and that's, that's really detrimental, especially for children who, who we know, I mean, teenagers go through all kinds of, all kinds of phases. Um, and we know that, that for, for most children, this gender dysphoria around puberty is a phase. Nearly nine out of 10 children uh, will outgrow gender dysphoria if they're simply allowed to go through a normal puberty and, and you know, provide them excellent, compassionate mental health services, talk therapy. Um, you know, some of these kids will will turn out to be gay. Some of them will turn out to be bisexual. Some of them will turn out to be straight. Um, but they will turn out to be healthy, unmutilated adults who are not lifelong medical and surgical patients. Um, and so what we really need to do is stop medicalizing these children, stop selling them on this, th them and their parents on this narrative that this will fix all of their problems and, and really do the hard work and dive deep into addressing 
the true underlying issues. I think you answered that that perfectly. Uh, that was that was really really good. Yeah. Um. I think one question I had that I forgot to ask you about that Dutch study that you mentioned. What year was that? You know, I will have to to check into that and and get back to you on that. I was wondering um, if it was more I, recent, or more of an older um, study that's kind of been, yeah, yeah. The Dutch, the it was a, a an ongoing study mm -hmm. that went on for many years, and I know the final findings of that have come out within the last few years, and that's uh, driven a lot of Europe to stop these procedures on children. We really learned that that this is not not helping children and really harming them. Um, and, and in Finland, for instance, uh, Finland's uh, youth gender medicine expert uh, said, you know, very eloquently, this transition or suicide narrative, transition or die narrative that we, that we often hear about, unfortunately, um, one of uh, Do No Harm's uh, patient advocates, Chloe Cole, who uh, was transitioned herself as a child, had a had a double mastectomy. Um, you know, she has talked numerous times about how her parents were told, you know, would you rather have a live son or a dead daughter? Um, and Finland's youth gender medicine expert said that this transition or die narrative is really purposeful disinformation. And in fact, we know that that these that the children and adults actually after these surgeries become depressed and are more likely to attempt and commit suicide after this this transition because there there's deep regret surgical complications uh, lifelong maintenance and and again I I'm happy to get into the details but I don't want to be uh, too graphic uh, for your audience here yeah, honestly, if you wouldn't mind getting into the details, and then when I put my script together, and my news director can look at it and see what's yeah. going on. Because I do think this is a really important topic, especially in the day that we live in today. Obviously, I'm not you know, going to put any pictures or videos or anything like that, but uh, it's better to have it than not, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind. Ab absolutely. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so we start with this path of, of what's called social transition that's sold as this very benign idea that we're going to uh, change change names, change pronouns, um, get a new wardrobe, and um, and that this is 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 very benign. But unfortunately, we see that this just becomes an on ramp, and there's a lot of social capital involved in that. These children are often celebrated in school that you know they have a new name, they become the teacher's favorite, um, and, and they're paraded. And that really reinforces that behavior, especially in, in vulnerable young children. So for the children, even if they're, you know, one of those nine out of 10 that's going to outgrow this, they've now got this huge social pressure to continue down this pathway um, to say that this has made me, you know, gotten me a lot of attention and popularity and to, to step away from that and to doubt that. Um, really brings in a lot of cognitive dissonance. And also, I think I'll, I'll mention as well that this is really the only way that we have in today's society to, to reinvent yourself, right? Um, you know, I can't say tomorrow, you know, I'm, I'm not Jared, I'm, I'm Joe now. I'm going to get a new wardrobe. I'm going to find a bunch of friends and I'm going to be celebrated for the bravery of saying, no, that wasn't me. I'm I'm reinventing myself, and so this this uh, gender transition has become a societally acceptable, and I would even go so far as to say societally celebrated in some circles way of reinventing yourself, um, and and getting a lot of positive attention, and so I I think that's a lot of the dangers where where we start down this road. Um, and then the next step is these puberty blocking medications. Um, they're used off label. They've never been FDA approved uh, for this purpose. These medications are are used for 
treating precocious puberty, which is early puberty, you know, kids that are nine, 10 going through puberty um, and going to suffer from severely stunted growth, um, a lot of medical problems there. And then these medications are used in convicted sex offenders to chemically castrate them. So these are used off-label in an experimental capacity um, to, to children. And there's this narrative that, that puberty blockers simply buy time and that they don't cause any harm. Um, and, and they do. You can't simply pause puberty and, and stop the puberty blockers and restart puberty. You've missed out on key months and years of physical development and brain development. And you never recover from that. And then the other side of that is we see from the research, again, which study you look at, 97 to 100% of, of children who start those puberty blockers then go on to the cross-sex hormones. So for, for girls um, who think they're boys, that's, that's testosterone, and that comes with risks of heart attacks and stroke and high cholesterol, uh, aggressive behavior, a depression, suicidal thoughts, suicide attempts. Um, and then for boys who think they're girls, uh, that's uh, progesterone and estrogen as well. And then we know that, that these levels of estrogen uh, cause a risk of, of blood clots, blood clots in the legs, um, blood clots in the lungs, and those blood clots in the lungs can, can be fatal, can, can result in, in death. Um, and, and mental health effects as well. Um, so we start on this road down, down to these, uh, across sex hormones. And then we have the surgeries. Um, so for, for going back to, to, uh, girls who think they're boys, this often starts with a, a double mastectomy or what's known colloquially as top surgery. And that is, is what it sounds like. It's removing the breasts of a healthy young girl. I mean, in medicine, we have to remove the breasts of some women who have breast cancer to save their lives. Um, but we're not saving the, these kids' lives. And in fact, we're, we're scarring them uh, physically and emotionally, uh, causing great physical and emotional harm uh, for, for no reason, um, the, these kids are, are physically well. Um, and then uh, for, for girls who wish to, to go on to bottom surgery, uh, one of the, the most brutal and experimental procedures is what's called a phalloplasty or creation of an artificial penis. And what they do is they take the skin from the forearm and remove it. And they remove it with the, the nerves, the blood vessels, um, and remove this full thickness of, of skin from the arm to fold up into a tube, uh, which is then sewn onto the groin to create this artificial penis. That forearm is then down to bone, basically. So they then take, go to the other forearm and take part of the skin off of that arm and put it onto the other arm, which they took skin and fat and, and blood vessels um, from. And then attempt to sew this tube of skin, this artificial penis, um, onto the groin. And whether there's adequate blood supply for that and whether it it survives or it, it simply uh, necroses or dies and, and falls off. Again, very high complication rates. Uh, we think that upwards of, of two out of three of these patients develop severe complications. And, and these surgeries are, are, are designed as multiple surgeries. So they don't do this all in one step. They, they take these, these kids back to the operating room time after time uh, to do different revisions. Um, one of the things they'll do is to extend the urethra so that these girls can 
attempt to urinate standing up through this artificial phallus. And that is just fraught with complications. They often develop leaks where the um, urethra is extended and the urine leaks out or, or worse goes in between the tissues and creates an, an, an irritation and an infection. Um, just awful, awful procedures here. Uh, for boys who, who think they're girls, the the, the bottom surgery is is equally as as bad. Um, one of the the surgeries is to remove the the testicles to to castrate the boy, and then uh, fillet open the the penis, remove all the insides of the penis, and then turn the penis inside out um, to invert it as a, a canal that is then uh, stuffed inside the, the male pelvis, which doesn't have room for this, um, and then packed with bolsters. And then these, um, the, these men now have to dilate or, or keep open this false vagina, and that becomes a lifelong task. Uh, daily, several times a week, they're having to insert uh, medical grade dildos or dilators into this artificial vagina uh, to keep it open because the body sees it as a as a surgical wound, as a wound, uh, and the body tries to close it off. And so they have to work to keep this open. With many of these children, uh, Jazz Jennings being a, a famous one who was on TV, um, who have this these puberty blockers started at such an early age, um, their penis and scrotum never fully develops. And, um, and not only that, but the, the director of WPATH, which is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, uh, Dr. Marcy Bowers, who her, herself is a, a man who, who is trying to live as a woman, um, has said that these children who were blocked in early stage puberty um, at, at 10, 11, 12 years old um, don't develop the capacity to orgasm so that most of these uh, children uh, will never go on to have sexual satisfaction um, after these, you know, even before or after these surgeries. Um, but what happens is because there's not adequate development of the male genitalia, which is used as the material to create this artificial vagina, the surgeons then have to perform abdominal surgery to harvest a portion of the colon or the large intestine, and then uh, bring this down into the pelvis to use that as the, the artificial vagina. And then as you can imagine, anytime you start cutting into the, the large intestine, you have the risk of, of feces, of fecal matter leaking out into the abdomen. Um, you have uh, potential discharge from this, this false artificial vagina. Um, and then regardless of the method of the surgery, whether, whether it's um, inversion of the penis or a, a graft of the colon, or a combination of, of both sometimes, or sometimes the, the penis fails and then they have to go take the colon, uh, we can see fistula formation. Again, the male pelvis doesn't have a lot of room inside. You can look at the, the structure of, of the male versus female pelvis. Um, and so what happens is that the, the rectum can develop a hole in it, uh, and that hole communicates with this artificial vagina and you start having feces or poop coming out of the new vagina. And again, leading to awful infections and the need for these repeat surgeries. And at that point, once you've got that fistula developed, that communication between the rectum and this, this artificial vagina, 
the surgeries to attempt to fix that are just fraught with even more complications. Um, and, and many of these patients have to then have that artificial vagina completely removed and then are dealing with lifelong complications. They, they may have lost part of their, their colon, their intestine that was harvested and then removed. Um, so these surgeries are, are just awful um, and experimental. And, and this is, you know, not even getting into, you know, putting breast implants into a male chest, which doesn't have the, the muscle or fat distribution. Um, so you get these uh, breast implants in, in men that, that point outward. They look like this, this kind of Mickey Mouse look where, uh, where the breasts are, are pointing outward. Uh, you can also have a problem where there's not enough muscle mass on the center of the chest and the two implants end up migrating together, um, forming this this large single uniboob is, is the, the colloquial term um, for that. And again, uh, very challenging to treat. And then in, in men trying to become women, all these facial surgeries, breaking facial bones, breaking the jaw, uh, putting uh, plates into the face, um, breaking and reforming the nose. Uh, we've now started to see procedures where they take ribs out to try to create a more feminine body shape, uh, shorten the collarbone, the clavicle to, to narrow the shoulders. Uh, I mean, these these procedures are just, um, just brutal and, and really all experimental and just fraught with terrible complications. Well, well, thank you so much for that information. Even at times it's a little hard to listen to, but I think, you know, I think everybody needs to hear this, especially parents and, and things like that to hear about it. And so just kind of like to, um, wrap this up, cause I know I took a lot way longer of your time cause this is a super interesting interesting topic to me to talk about um but so do no harm you guys are saying that just for minors this is this is a catastrophe to do this but once you are an adult if this is what you want to do then this is something that you can do or do you guys still like to warn about hey like even if you are these are just the complications that come with with all of this yeah, yeah thanks for the question mark we really try to stay out of the the adult side here. Um, we we don't take a stance there. Um, I think these surgeries are are all of these procedures are very detrimental and fraught with complications. Um, we recognize that adults have the right to make decisions over their own body, uh, whether those be good decisions or bad decisions. Um, but really, what our organization is about is. Is, is twofold. First of all, is protecting children, uh, children who, who don't have the capacity to make these uh, irreversible lifelong decisions. We don't let children get tattoos. Um, we, we don't let children drink alcohol. We, um, we know that children do not have the level of mature decision-making that adults do. And so our, our organization's focus is around protecting children uh, from this ideology. And then the, the, the second aspect, as I spoke about earlier, is restoring um, merit uh, as the, the key measure in medicine and provisioning of healthcare services, providing care to people as individuals, um, not picking doctors or how we treat patients uh, based on the color of their skin or their sexual orientation or, or class membership. Um, so really our focus is, is, is twofold, protecting children and uh, respecting and treating individuals as individuals. Right. That's exactly what I was kind of looking for. So thank you for that. I know I don't have too much time left. And again, I already know I took too, a lot of your time. But um, if you happen to have any statistics and numbers um, that you guys could send my way kind of um, so that I can I can use and put it in there. Um, anything that you guys think would be helpful, anything like numbers, for example, of like when kids are just allowed to go through puberty without any of these hormone blockers, without, without any of these things, then X, Y and Z. But when they are as, you know, minors, then X, Y, and Z happen. So if you have any of those numbers, those would be greatly appreciated.
Absolutely. I've, uh, we've got a uh, transgender treatment for minor myth versus fact, um, fact sheet that's got eight myths on it, all with the citations to the, the medical literature. So I can send that over to you. Um, I believe I've got your email on the invite. No, it doesn't look like. Uh, yeah, I can, I can give it to you. It's super easy. If you're, okay. Whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Is it okay if I move my camera yeah, course, or yeah, and we're all done so yeah okay it. yeah it's they're ready here i'll just okay go ahead it's m g a d at cbs 19 news.com Okay. okay. I will shoot you an email with uh, with that information, that fact sheet, and I'll put our media team on that as well. So if there's any additional information, we can get you. Um, happy to happy to provide that. Uh, love to direct your viewers to our website. Our organization website is do no harm medicine.org, do no harm medicine.org. And the uh, Stop the Harm database, our new database project is uh, stop the harm database.com. Perfect. I know we've only got a minute left until this meeting, but one last question. Yeah. Who is compiled in Do No Harm? Is it all medical professionals or in some activists or kind of what's what's the lay of the land there? Yeah, so Do No Harm is, uh, is open to everyone. Uh, we've been around two years. We have over 12,000 members. Uh, that includes healthcare professionals, policymakers, um, parents, uh, concerned members of the public. Uh, membership is open to everyone and we've really uh, seen a huge increase in membership from across the, across the spectrum of, of uh, people. Perfect. Well, Dr. Jared, thank you so much for, for all your time and all, all your information. I truly do appreciate it. Um, I haven't heard back from UV or anything like that, but this is probably still going to air tonight. Um, we'll put the video on our website and I'll make sure um, that I send it over in an email or something like that. So you guys can take a look at it. Okay. Sounds great, Mark. Thanks so much. The, the video is going to air tonight, you said? Yes. And if you could send over an uncut version of the the Zoom interview, uh, that would be great because I'm sure our team would love to uh, love to have access to it. I'm I'm guessing the segment today is going to be tonight is going to be fairly short. Yeah, it's going to be like one thirty to two minutes. OK, yeah, yeah, I'm sure our media team would love to have the full absolutely uh, full in interview as well. Absolutely. Awesome.